you've got a big problem here in the big tech space, which is that this is not a commodity product. Uh, this is infer this is access to hearts and minds. This is elections. This is support for referendums or economic policy. Uh, you know, immigration policy, cultural. I mean, everything is mediated by the underlying products and services of, of big tech. And when they basically abandoned their tacit neutrality charter in two, after the 2016 election, um, it, as I see it, the US government should have immediately uh, uh, put a halt to all international favors until they went back to a standard of relative neutrality. Um, you know, the you know the joke that I say here is, you know, if, if we had known that Google was going to do, you know, do what it did after the 2016 election, we would have used Lycos or Ask Jeeves or something, you know, back in 1995. We wouldn't have given it all this market power if we knew that the moment they could get away with it, um, they would switch that to basically try to, uh, you know, play God with respect to politics, culture, so, you know, uh, so, social norms, economic preferences. Everything can now be programmed in to to the AI to uh, to shift hearts and minds, how, however they deem fit. And so it's just it's it's a totally different thing than than the sort of relationship the U.S. government has, has traditionally had. And I, I think if it's not stopped now, uh, this is this is how you get to a CCP style situation in China. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and this week is just me. Nick has stuff to do. We're really busy here at American Moment. We're in the middle of all of our crazy programming here this season. Uh, I've been doing fellowship interviews all week. We've got Foundations of American Statecraft, Conflict, Foreign Policy, and Diplomacy launching soon. Keep an eye on all of that by going to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find the backlog of this podcast, Moment of Truth. You can find other programs that we're up to. You can find uh, news articles where the fake news lying media continually references me and the things that I say and do. And in general, keep up with everything that American Moment is all about. You know, there was a format for podcast episodes that I started toying with last season where I would just put a really, really smart person in front of me um, that knows a lot about a topic that horrifies me and pepper them with a trillion questions. Uh, this is one of those. Uh, Mike Benz is the executive director of the Foundation for Freedom Online, a nonprofit watchdog dedicated to protecting digital liberties and restoring the free and open internet. Previously, Mike was in charge of cyber and big tech portfolios for the U.S. State Department under President Trump, where he served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Communications and Information Technology. That role included formulating and negotiating U.S. policy on cyber issues, as well as interfacing with private industry and civil society institutions in the big tech space. Mike was confirmed Fed, but one of the good Feds. <laughs> Prior to his State Department role, Mike served as a White House speechwriter for President Trump and advised on tech matters. And before that, he was a speechwriter to Housing and Urban Development Secretary. Dr. Ben Carson was a policy advisor and economic development. Just as a sidebar, um, if you've traced some of the funny things um, uh, about this podcast, you'll notice that a lot of the admin officials that had very, very important roles at the end of the administration started out as HUD. Why was that? Because there was one very, very good patriot um, whose name will go unstated, though most of you know who he is, who was there, who when he went over to the presidential personnel office, dragged all the awesome people with him. And thank God he did, because some of the best gosh darn people in the administration uh, started out in that HUD office. Before his roles in the public sector, Mike practiced business law as an attorney in New York, primarily representing technology companies and financial firms. And we talked about tech censorship. And I've had a lot of conversations about tech censorship over the years, including on this podcast, but I'll say none have been as edifying as the conversations I've had with Mike, frankly, in just the last 48 hours. We only met uh, like 12 hours before we taped this. Um, he is a wealth of knowledge for congressional staff that are listening to this more so than ever. I highly encourage you, if you would like Mike's advice, uh, whether you're working for the Weaponization Committee or any other committee engaging in oversight in the Biden administration or the tech censorship regime that rules our lives, reach out to me or reach out to Mike directly and we'll put you guys in touch and he will gladly spend as much time as it takes making sure you know exactly what you need to do in order to hold these companies accountable. There is a totalizing war happening on the American people through digital censorship. It cannot be allowed to continue. Otherwise, we don't live in a real country anymore. We live in a fake country. Listen 
to every minute of this episode. It's extremely important. We'll go now to Mike Benz. Howdy, Mike. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. We always like to hear about how our guests got to where they are today. Um, tell us the story. You've got an interesting journey. Uh, you're one of the vanishingly few technologically literate people on the right. So clearly the conservative movement didn't make you. Who did? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So before my time in government, I was a tech lawyer, um, worked in uh, firms on uh, basically tech deal flow, also represented media companies um, uh, for a range of M&A and financial transactions. Um, I was very passionate about tech policy. Uh, I, I got an opportunity to join the, um, the last administration, uh, working as a speechwriter for Dr. Ben Carson and as a sort of economic policy advisor on some of the initiatives that were going on with low cost housing. I'd done some real estate work as well. Uh, so I started in, in government, uh, at, at HUD there and then, uh, then I went up to the, the White House as a, as a White House speechwriter and as a sort of uh, some basically tech policy advisory um, uh, capacities there. And from there, transitioned to the State Department where I, I ran the, uh, the, the cyber desk, essentially, the big tech portfolio. Uh, and that was a range of essentially national security roles, um, uh, uh, bilateral tech policy vis-a-vis -vis individual countries or regions like China, EU, uh, and then also working uh, with the sort of private sector U.S. national champions on big tech like Google and Facebook. And that's really where I ran into uh, what I currently do. I'm the executive director of, um, of the Foundation for Freedom Online, which uh, our, our goal is to help restore the uh, the free and open internet, the, the golden age of information meritocracy that really existed before the age of mass social media censorship. So just as a final sort of note on that, um, my time at the State Department uh, towards the end of 2020 was really a period of very intense consolidation between big government and big tech. And I found it to be scandalous, uh, if not unconscionable, what was being done with respect to the social contract that had long existed between the federal government and large corporations. If I can sketch that out for one Please. more second. So there has always been a intense relationship between our, our national champions and the State Department uh, as instruments of statecraft. You know, from, from the days of big sugar in Latin America to big oil in the Middle East, there was always a sort of relationship of the government does favors for corporations and corporations basically by, by succeeding internationally, there's a, there's a sort of trickle down dividend. There's cheaper gas prices, bananas cost less, you know, uh, 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 more capital from emerging markets with U S champions, uh, dominating, uh, uh, international private enterprise. Um, that, that tacit understanding, that the American people would benefit from the relationship between big government and big corporations was broken in the big tech space when the social contract that underlied the rise of these big tech companies as neutral arbiters was broken really in 2020 when one after another, every single major tech platform uh, unilaterally moved in lockstep uh, towards a system of complete domineering social media, domestic censorship. Uh, and so you had this strange situation where you, where the government was doing favors for corporations who were using that to basically subvert and discriminate against the very people who voted for that government. I found that to be untenable and uh, I wanna do everything I could in civil society when I left government to try to uh, reverse that course. I think so much of, um what you just said uh, goes back to the nature of that role you had at the State Department. I want to dig into a, a little bit more about it because it, I, I think to the uninitiated, it'll, it'll sound crazy that there's a role at the State Department responsible for everything you laid out. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Like, you know, you said cyber desk, you know, mm -hmm. for people who are not aware of the jargon, um, what is that? Um, and, and, and what did your day to day look like uh, working in that role? Sure. So my technical title was Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Communications and Information Technology. It's sort of a you know a long way of saying all things that have to do with 
international communications, such as social media platforms, telecom, you know, uh, a lot of my work also involved 5G and, you know, dealing with the Huawei sort of, uh, you know, uh, threat from China and so far as, you know, the, the battle for 21st century IT infrastructure that underlies you know, what does Brazil use for its IT infrastructure? If it's something that is in line with the US or NATO, that's a very different sort of security posture for us vis-a-vis -vis that country than if they were using Chinese IT architecture. I mean, this is one example of that. So you, you've got security issues, you have economic issues, and then you have um, policy issues. You know, the, how you know, uh, platform governance issues around the use of AI or around responsible you know, AI. Um, and, you know, what you have here is, to answer the question more directly, um, corporations rely on the U.S. government to fight for it abroad, for, for them to maintain the advantages that they do, and protection against foreign governments in the places where they are operating, whether that be the U.S. government uh, uh, applying pressure to maintain low taxes or favorable tariff structure, favorable regulations, um, you name it. Uh, the, the, the way we manage the world empire, so to speak, um, is, is, through, um, is, is through all the different assets at, at the disposal of state uh, to use as instruments of statecraft. So uh, in, in this case, if Google does well in Europe. This was this is one of the situations I ran into. You know, um, you know, Google had a problem in in late 2020 where there was uh, this this EU Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act, which threatened Google's data monopoly in Europe. Uh, essentially, uh, Europe was pursuing something they called the Digital Strategic Autonomy Initiative, um, which started out ironically, perhaps because the EU was sort of spooked by the Trump election and thought that the big tech companies were all going to sort of uh, be wielded by the Trump administration as a uh, to undermine the sovereignty of, of EU countries. Um, that initiative sort of took on a life of its own. And even though there was a clear fork in the road between the agenda of the big tech companies and Trump, they nevertheless continued the pursuit of this digital strategic autonomy initiative. And so, you know, I got a call from nine Google lobbyists one day uh, who you basically asked me to reformulate U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis our posture towards the European Digital Digital Markets Act, uh, and to um, you know to recognize that Google is a national champion and that U.S. jobs, you know, revenue, uh, uh, you know, every all manner of of benefits will accrue to the U.S. government uh, and to the, to the American people was the argument. You know, if if uh, if the U.S. applies the unique brand of diplomatic pressure we can bring in these in these circumstances. Now, as they were telling me that, um, you had a sort of hotly contested in process U.S. election where Google uh, had updated its terms of service and had enforced hundreds of thousands, even millions, of of terms of service violations, banning you know everyday Americans who own flower shops from having a YouTube channel. You know, if you, you know, there was a period where if you had your YouTube account terminated, you'd lose your Gmail account. You couldn't have a job in sales and marketing in this country if you don't have, if you don't have access to Google services. And yet Google was using its extraordinary market power to completely change the way Americans could talk about core democratic processes in their own country. Meanwhile, they were relying on the U.S. government to pry open emerging markets, to consolidate political control over over uh, uh, NATO countries, uh, I this was something when when this happened in the big oil space, you could make the argument that Americans were getting cheaper gas. You never had a situation where the gas, you know, uh, uh, you want to fill up your your car with gas, but because you voted for Truman, you know, you couldn't actually fill up your gas tank. Um, this was happening now uh, in the big tech space, um, and frankly, I think it requires a, a total reconfiguration of both that, that government tech relationship, as well as the social contract underlying the, uh, a lot of the, the legal supports that, that, they, that they, the big tech companies enjoy. You use the term national champions a couple of times. I, th I think this is a really important term to zero in on because it is going to be the 
to use some internet slang, cope that these companies present over the next few years, um, especially you know now that we're entering you know great power competition, registered trademark with China, and um, and and that the world is is you know there's chum in the water so to speak. Um, Google, Facebook, and and other companies have started coming around DC saying. No, 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 no. The reason you can't regulate us is because we are essential to American national security. We're your national champion, and golly gee, you wouldn't want some foreign competitor coming in on on our turf.、Uh, is there any merit to that? And well, what exactly、um, do you think the attitude should be towards these quote unquote national champions? Sure. So, and, and look, that is a、um, a difficult question with many schools of thought associated with it.、Um, Frankly, at the diplomatic level, I would feel comfortable playing the chessboard, so to speak, on on any one of those schools of thought because、um, there's a lot of flexibility depending on which road you go down. You know, it's it, you can argue that they are national champions and and absolutely put the thumb on the press in every conceivable way,、um, or you could、uh, basically not adopt that that doctrine. As folks like Senator Mike Lee from Utah has been big on sort of revoking this. Um, national champions doctrine,、uh, and you could focus on other levers that the U.S. has to bring besides、uh, besides the sort of using our big corporations as institutes as instruments of statecraft.、Um, th- there are other cards to play,、uh, uh, although you do lose something because of the economic, the you know, the personnel, the 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 data. I mean, there's 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 so much that that you know. The State Department, the IC,、uh, you know, all, every all, the whole NGO constellation around USAID and NED. There, there's a lot of positive spillover from、um, uh, for advancing U.S. interests when you do have a big corporation to to use as a battering ram for the advancement of U.S. interests.、Um, so you do sort of handicap yourself by by not exploiting that, so to speak.、Uh, but You've got a big problem here in the big tech space, which is that these are not. This is not a lemonade stand.、Um, it's not even sugar or oil. This is not a commodity product.、Uh, this is infer. This is access to hearts and minds. This is elections. This is support for referendums or or, you know,、uh, s- social uh, doctrine. Uh, Economic policy,、uh, you know, immigration policy, cultural—I mean, everything is mediated by the underlying products and services of, of big tech.、Um, and when, when they basically abandoned their tacit neutrality charter two, after the 2016 election,、um, it, as I see it, the U.S. government should have immediately.、Uh, Uh, put a halt to all international favors until they went back to a standard of relative neutrality.、Um, you know the you know the joke that I say here is, you know if if we had known that Google was going to do you know do what it did after the 2016 election, we would have used Lycos or Ask Jeeves or something. You know back in 1995, we wouldn't have given it all this market power if we knew that the moment they could get away with it,、um, they would switch that to basically try to. Uh, you know, play God with respect to politics, culture, so,、uh, s- social norms, economic preferences. Everything can now be programmed in to to the AI to、uh, to shift hearts and minds, however however they deem fit. And so it's just it's it's a totally different thing than than the sort of relationship the U.S. government has, has traditionally had. And I, I think if it's not stopped now,、uh, this is this is how you get to a CCP style situation in China. Where you do have total, you know, just totalizing fusion between the, you know, a, a single party state and the corporate and、um, and economic you know, levers underpinning it. I, I think that even at the civil military fusion level, I think there's a similar story here. Google is a military contractor.、Uh, you know, our CIA, our State Department,、uh, our DOD all runs on private enterprise. Uh, uh, for for its cloud architecture and everything, so I'll, I'll pause there. But I think that I hope that answers this question. You know, it's interesting. You 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 point to 2016 as an inflection point in when these companies really ratcheted up、uh, their censorship. One, 
2016 is like six years ago. So there's there's plenty of history after that too. Um, but I'm really curious about the history before that. Uh, give us you know a, a brief or not so brief history of tech censorship. When did this all start? Who was responsible for starting it? And how did we get so far without noticing? Sure. Well, the long version is a lot of fun. So if I can have some space to sketch it Please. out, it might be uh, beneficial for, for some of the audience. So you, know, you had the internet start as basically an ARPA project in the 1960s. And a lot of its early use cases were for the US military for counterinsurgency purposes in, in Vietnam and elsewhere, aggregating social science data from universities. In 19... In the late 80s, uh, you know, ARPA slash DARPA turns it over, turns the internet over to the National Science Foundation, basically mediates through four universities, including Stanford. Uh, it gets rolled out in 1991 is the World Wide Web is a private, you know, it's private now. It's a, it's, you know, it's open to the entire world. Very quickly, um, uh, the U.S. national security state um, moved to, uh, uh, to take advantage of internet freedom around the world for purposes of advancing U.S. interests. Google started as a DARPA grant uh, to Sergey Brin and Larry, Larry Page uh, at Stanford back before it was Google um, when they were doing search engine optimiz optimization research. They got DARPA funding at Stanford. Uh, they had a CIA and NSA advisor uh, for purposes of basically a joint CIA-NSA program called the Massive Digital Data Program. Essentially, the intelligence community and our foreign policy uh, establishment quickly deduced that birds of a feather would flock together online. And so they started this birds of a feather program to be able to identify, you know, what people in, in Tunisia, they're all congregating on the same forums and blogs. This is before social media. Uh, even then, there was this birds of a feather phenomenon with the kind of websites that foreign insurgency groups or political groups. Um, so would, this is 0203? This is 95, actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so social media, you have Facebook in 2004, YouTube in 2005, Twitter in 2006, the iPhone in 2007. In 2007, um, a young guy uh, shows up uh, at the State Department's Office of Policy Coordination, the OPC. So the Office of Policy Coordination, or OPC, is the, the place in which US overt and covert foreign policy is synchronized. It's the meeting point, essentially, between the State Department and the CIA. Um, Jared Cohen was a very, very young guy when he showed up to uh, to OPC, very young. I think he was only 24, 26. Uh, his specialization was youth movements. And, um, uh, you know, this is a big part of the national security state, the foreign policy establishment. We essentially play two sides of a chessboard when it comes to managing the world empire. We've got the insurgency card. Uh, and we've got the counterinsurgency card. You know, we, we support, uh, you know, uh, counter. Uh, we ins we support insurgency efforts when we want to do regime change, or we want to destabilize or influence the in the uh, the ruling party in a particular country or region, uh, in order to be more pliant to U.S. interests. Or we play the counterinsurgency card, where we uh, where we're trying to protect a certain political group in power from political or paramilitary threats coming from other political forces in that country. In the early days of the internet, uh, internet freedom was a meme championed by the national security state to play the insurgency card to, because you could have instant revolutions through the use. You could bypass state control over media. This is why it was the Pentagon who was funding, you know, it's funding end to end encrypted chat VPNs to, to, so that, uh, so that the local state government wouldn't be able to track the IP addresses, um, uh, um, tour. I mean, you name it. It's, Internet anonymity, freedom on the internet, was a DOD, State Department, IC initiative from 1991 until 2014, essentially. And I'll get to that inflection point in a second here. And it wasn't until it started to backfire politically that they transitioned to a counterinsurgency model. Um, and, uh, and that ended up having massive spillover at home because they started to view populism as a sort of insurgency threat that, that, a, that, that censorship could solve. Uh, now, I'll get to that in a second. So, so Jared Cohen is basically this, you know, youth revolutionary guru to the to the boomers, if you will, uh, at the State Department in two thousand seven. Republican, a Bush Bush appointee under Condoleezza Rice. 
he looks around and he sees all these 40, 50, 60 year olds, you know, and he says, why are we planning operations uh, through U.S. embassies or consulates or CIA station houses? Everybody we want to mobilize in Egypt, everybody we want to mobilize Middle East, North Africa, Southeast, everyone we want to mobilize is on Facebook. They're on Twitter. What are we doing? The analog. We need a new digital statecraft doctrine. We need something that would go on to be called Diplomacy 2.0. Uh, or the doctrine of digital statecraft. And this represented a sort of merger of social media with traditional uh, 20th century um, uh, uh, in, insurgency work uh, for purposes of of creating a favorable political ecosystem in every target country. It, when who, if, if, if that's your portfolio country at, at state, you're going to want to be implementing Diplomacy 2.0 to try to, you know, whatever your checklist is of, of priority items vis-a-vis -vis that, that country's own policies. So uh, that culminated in the Arab Spring um, in, uh, you know, in, in the early 2010s. You had this sort of period where one after another adversary country in Middle East, North Africa, uh, underwent a sudden and unexpected social media revolution culminating in regime change where where uh, <laughs> everyone on the on the you know uh, neo axis of quasi evil uh, in in that in that region uh, was replaced by youth movements powered by Facebook and Twitter. Uh, at that moment, uh, Jared Cohen was named one of the top fifty most powerful people in in Washington by, by Time Magazine. Young, I think he was like twenty eight years old. Could have done anything, uh, but he goes over. And this is now something like two thousand twelve um, to. At the time, a mid-sized company that was not even in the top 100 by market cap. It was number 120, and that was Google. And at the time in Washington, that was there was a lot of uh, you know, what is he? Is, this kid this kid could be president one day. What is he doing going over to you know Google? Well, Google had just created a one-person think tank called Google Ideas, and that one person was Jared Cohen, whose job was supposed to be to sit in a room all day and think about all the big, beautiful, creative ways that Google could use its proprietary data uh, and, and you know, empire it had built uh, on the data and search side uh, to solve complex geopolitical problems, um, i.e. essentially to, to become a sort of shadow state department using uh, the very vehicle of the locus point between state and CIA. Now, this comes into the censorship story because... Uh, we live in an age of AI censorship. Over nine, over ninety, something between ninety nine eight and 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 ninety nine percent, depending on the on the platform of of all proactive content takedowns online are first flagged by AI at the content level. It was zero percent before two thousand seventeen. Zero. The only AI censorship that existed before the story I'm about to describe here was you had things like child porn, right? Where where you know, there was there were AI techniques around near duplicate hashing. You know, where you would you would compare. You know, the you you'd have a filter that would automatically compare an image to whether the FBI had uploaded a, a comparable child porn image in a database or something like that. But there was nothing for speech, misinformation, disinformation, uh, hate speech, targeted abuse and harassment. Any one of the terms, none of that was proactively flagged by the words you said uh, using AI. Um, that all changed with Jared Cohen. Uh, Jared Cohen paid very special attention to the uh, events in, around Brexit and um, and the U.S. Uh, 2016 presidential election, and uh, used Jigsaw. With Google Ideas renamed itself to what's currently called Google Jigsaw to develop what was previously a DARPA uh, a DARPA originally funded this program to use something called natural language processing. It's an AI technique to examine words to assess sort of the political topography of of different kinds of, of of narratives or doctrines online you can pull out the prefixes the suffixes the the hashtags the you know the sort of the dialect of of a of of an of an idea almost almost the way sort of academic jargon gave give gave rise to sort of a sophisticated sort of you know mar, uh, dialect of marxism there's a similar thing with respect to maga or with, with respect to isis you know dialect uh, but if you can simply train your 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 models on on that political ideology, you can then use that for content moderation purposes in highly sophisticated and targeted ways. 
Jared Cohen at Jigsaw, well, immediately after the 2016 election, turned this DARPA-funded work that was originally funded by the DOD to look at the ways ISIS was recruiting on Facebook and Twitter to do it. They trained it on, th- on three basically sets of, of, of political training data. Uh, the 2016 election and Donald Trump, the events in Brexit and, uh, and around Nigel Farage, the Brexit party and the Brexit vote, and climate change was the third one. And you could actually go onto their AI censorship. Uh, 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 basically, you know, they had they had a website, they had a whole sort of, you know, API plug. Uh, you could actually go in and you could see the toxicity score that was attached to any statement around those three topic areas. It was, a, they had, it was, it was, it was public. You could even go on their, their site and do that. They ended up rolling that out to the social media companies. It ended up becoming standard. Uh, and then there became a gold rush um, to develop more and more AI, uh, sophisticated AI domestic censorship super weapons for control over political discourse. And, and you know, I watched that happen over multiple years. And currently, now it's funded by the government. You have a $40 million program at the National Science Foundation for exactly this to stop people from talking about COVID origins. Where are the places where the research and work on this is happening outside of the formal four corners of of the tech companies themselves. We've mentioned the government, the State Department, National Science Foundation, but I know that the there are academic institutions that play a very heavy role in this. Tell me a little bit about those. Yes. What's happening now is essentially a, you know, a, a, a it's sort of a rhyming to, to the historical version in the analog sector. During the Cold War, the universities played a huge role in the propaganda effort, both at home and abroad. Social science research uh, uh, captured ap- academics. There was, you know, I want to, without going too deep into the details there, um, universities, social sciences in the universities have been completely rejuvenated by this focus on on domestic censorship from from the U.S. government. You know, there was always a sort of um, so I'll give you an example. There's so my foundation has documented 42 U.S. Un- colleges and universities who've received um, uh, uh, over over 65 uh, grants in, in the past 18 months, just from the National Science Foundation alone, totaling $40 million uh, just for AI censorship work to develop uh, fast, precise, and comprehensive content moderation models for mis- and disinformation. So you, you have- What was the cost spelling for most of this COVID? COVID and uh, electoral skepticism is another one. Basically, people have a problem with mail-in ballots or early voting drop boxes or, uh, you know, there's there's a whole sort of democracy bend to this. Um, but, you know, it, it's unsurprisingly diversified around a bunch of pet policies of the, the national security state and certain political uh, factions as well. You know, the, some of this bleeds into climate misinformation models, immigration misinformation. So, but but by far and away, the the top two um, uh, targets for mis- and disinformation are COVID skepticism and uh, you know elect you know electoral skepticism is basically the way they they, they phrase it. Um, but it's you know it's proxies for do you, you know you're having a wrong opinion on COVID and and supporting Donald Trump is basically. I mean, when it's it's not you don't need to X-ray through it too deep to, to when you start looking at their slide decks and their video presentations to I mean they're literally flashing images of like you know Trump as they're pre- as they're presenting their pitch for five million dollars in taxpayer funding for what kind of misinformation they're doing mm-hmm. I mean it's 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 cartoonishly naked but um, but what you have is essentially this onboarding of civil society the universities nonprofits. Uh, community leaders and foundations as a sort of censorship mercenary army. Um, now, you know, not to be too over the top or or you know, or whatnot about this, but you know, the church committee hearings unearthed in in the in the nineteen seventies about you know twenty years worth of psychological behavioral modification work that the intelligence community was doing around you know. People talk about MK Ultra and whatnot, and you know, there's a lot of attention to, you know, the use of drugs or whatnot for that. But a lot of it was just about studying the social science of crowd behavior, how to influence hearts and minds and and crowds, principally, you know, because that was a big part of our Cold War effort to try to win insurgency and counterinsurgency 
scuffles in Soviet sa- satellite states in in Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. You, you know, it was after after the 1948 UN Declaration on Human Rights, you, and you couldn't take over territory by force anymore. Everything moved subkinetic. It was about political control, and and in a democratic country, that meant hearts and minds. So we had a huge positive media ecosystem with respect to Voice of America, Radio Lib- Free Liberty, Radio you know, America, the whole Wisner's Wurlitzer, you know, the sort of the media relations between um, uh, legacy media and the national security state. What's happening now is a terrifying parallel to that. The universe that were just, in, for example, I just mentioned MK Ultra. I mean, there were 45 universities who received government funding for what was essentially a CIA, DOD, psychological influence project. Well, my foundation, FFO, has documented 42 just in the past 18 months who've gotten government funding for psychological behavioral modification on, on belief in designated mis- and disinformation topics. You know, they're, they're basically trying to approximate the kind of, of bumper cars on democracy that existed before the internet when when the gatekeepers to information were much closer to the national security state than some 18-year-old kid with with six, 6 million twitter followers or whatever you know um but they had a real concern and if you turn back the clock you know you can see four star generals and former CIA NSA directors in 2019 telling the German Marshall Fund telling the Atlantic Council at all these conferences what are we going to do if the New York Times is reduced to a medium-sized Facebook page. What happens when when the back doors, uh, the checks and balances on democracy, the, na- the national security state used that? What happens if people get to set their own foreign policy? What happens if we lose control of the domestic drivers of foreign policy? And that's essentially the story here. It's not even a right-wing, left-wing thing because they were afraid of Jeremy Corbyn and an early iteration of Bernie Sanders as well. Yeah, it's it's funny that you you zero in on the foreign policy side of it because that strikes me as the space where it is most susceptible to a thumb on the scales, right? Because there are all of these natural barriers that are sprung up um, where in an era where it was, you know, the newspaper man needs to write about the stuff as a foreign correspondent and come back to the States and publish it. You, know, you could mess with all sorts of things. You can mess with their visas. You could say, okay, you can come here, but you have to be under American protection and we get to look at what you're saying. And oh no, that's classified. It's a national. There were all of these natural bottlenecks that were built into the system back in the day when it was CNN sends a correspondent to Bangladesh and sends them back. But now when your buddy in Afghanistan can text you what he's actually seeing, send you a video over high speed internet, that all breaks down. Right. And their bottlenecks are heavily, heavily attenuated until they can reimpose those bottlenecks right. through internet censorship. It's absolutely fascinating. I, I'd be curious to hear um, one one of the things that um, I, I've been harping on a lot lately um, for people in our sort of side of politics is, um, you know, we, we tend to be self-referential back to 2016, 17 a lot um, because it was such a titanic sea change in American politics with President Trump getting elected and everything. Um, it's been six years. <laughs> so so what's changed in the intervening time? You know, that if, if 2017 was V1.0 of censorship, mm-hmm. are we at V3.0, 10.0? What, what, what's the the new status quo that that is worse or better or, or, or about the same as what was going on in the immediate aftermath of Trump's election? Sure. So, you know, as I see it, by the way, you know, I sort of start the story really in 2014, you know, with the Crimea annexation. And this is this is way before the 2022, you know, current current scuffle. I mean, you know, 1.0 was really before Brexit when when you had this doctrine. It was originally called the Gerasimov Doctrine, and then it, its name changed to the Hybrid Warfare. And it was this... Um, you know, the national security state's involvement in internet censorship started with the events in Ukraine in 2014. You know, you, it you, all comes back to Ukraine. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, right? It's like the Seinfeld, you know, episode of yeah. the risk board. You know, the risk board, you know, is all depends on this, you know, this giant landmass in the center. And, you know, it's, uh, you, you had this, this moment where Republicans were very aggressive about Russia. You know, there's the famous Mitt Romney, Obama sort of line 
uh, after after the events in Georgia in 2008, and a lot of Republican foreign policy interests were were very concerned about about Russia and the allegation that Obama was soft on Russia, and Obama said, you know, oh, the 1980s called, they want their foreign policy back. But then it hit Ukraine, and that hit a lot of the the, the Democrat uh, economic interests around the around energy policy there, and so then they became you know super super hawkish on the issue. But what you had was you know the events in in 2014, um, you know, with the, the the two breakaway republics and then the the Crimea referendum to join the the Russian Federation, were were really the biggest foreign policy humiliation of the Obama era, and there was. Uh, it was the culmination of many years worth of fears that Russia was going to uh, reimpose effective political control over the sa- Soviet satellites that had been absorbed into NATO since 1991. Interestingly, the same year that the that the internet was privatized, uh, perhaps apropos of nothing. But the the point is, there was this there was a need at the time, uh, DOD, state, IC that when when the Crimea referendum happened there was this perceived need to uh to really have a uh, a a robust um media campaign to make sure that the hearts and minds of people in central and eastern europe um were uh just completely you know uh veered towards the euro atlantic side as opposed to the russian side by any means necessary. And that really meant total and dominating control over media and especially uh, internet alternatives that were seen to be sort of burgeoning at the time. And, you know, there was a lot of literature around the fact that, you know, RT and Sputnik had penetrated Central and Eastern Europe, that the that the, the gas relationships between Russia and Germany were were allowing this sort of, you know, blossoming of, of a sort of Russian media ecosystem. So this doctrine of hybrid warfare emerged to say that Basically, we need to look at warfare no longer as being about tanks, but being about tweets. In fact, NATO even created a doctrine called From Tanks to Tweets. Um, <laughs> and you can actually listen to Jen Stoltenberg's speeches on this from 2017 to 2019, where he declares this as the hybrid warfare doctrine. So from 2014 to 2016, you had this early internet censorship infrastructure that was set up in the Baltics, Sweden, uh, Estonia, and uh, and in, in in parts of Germany, you had these hybrid COE centers of excellence that NATO set up uh, where early content moderation uh, controls were tested out. And when Brexit happened in June 2016, it was the culmination of the worst fears of, of, of the, the sort of hybrid warfare, you know, uh, advocates, you know, this idea that, you know, you don't need to defeat a standing army. If you can just change the political leader, then, you know, then... That's effectively like taking over the country, right? So that was what they were arguing Russia was doing. When Brexit happened, uh, you know, we're familiar with Russiagate here in the US, but there was a equally um, uh, uh, influential campaign to portray Brexit as being a sort of Russian operation as well. And only one month after Brexit, in July 2016 at the Warsaw Conference, NATO effectively amended its charter to engage in really for the first time, you know, they, uh, uh, at least formally, I should say, uh, to be engaged in political warfare. They added this hybrid warfare uh, element to the charter under the Warsaw Conference the month after Brexit um, uh, under the sort of perception that everything they feared was happening in Central and Eastern Europe had now moved, you know, uh, all the way westward to Brexit. And then when, when five months later, Trump won the U.S. election, all the stops are pulled out. Yeah. And you had this merger between the highest levels of the of of the transatlantic national security state, U.S., U.K., NATO, and opportunistic political operatives, both from the Democrat Party and from the sort of for, tr- legacy foreign policy establishment of the Republican Party, all uh, forming as a sort of senior thought leadership cell around this brand new emerging field of of domestic speech related content moderation. And what you find is when you trace your way up uh, to every little NGO, every little, you know, private pop-up censorship firm, every little university, you know, that that we can talk about who has a role in this, uh, you trace your way up to the funding and to the thought leadership and to the, you know, the the sinecures that they all hold at these transatlantic institutions. 
it will come back to that same group every single time. And, you know, I mean, we can, we can use, we can talk about specific examples, but you really had the, this 1.0 from 2014 to 2016. Um, but then uh, 2017, you had this sort of trial and error period from about January to November, where they were, they were trying analog, uh, you know, censorship, you know, YouTube hired 10,000 more content moderators in early 2017. They tried to just throw more bodies at the problem. And we're finding that, that they had the quote whack-a-mole problem. Uh, the censors could not keep up with the pace, speed, and evolution of memes, of, you know, just kids on the internet. That was really when the, um, when the AI censorship super weapons entered the picture and totally changed things in 2018. Uh, it started with, uh, you know, what I call the transit, by the way, it'd be, feel free if to interject it in any of this. Um, you know, it started with what I call the transatlantic flank attack, which is basically these, you had these sort of uh, Hillary Clinton and Obama sort of State Department folks who had all been uh, tasked with, with coercing Europe to pass sanctions on Russia after Crimea. They did a similar roadshow on disinformation in, in 2017, uh, except instead of lobbying for sanctions, they were lobbying for censorship. This culminated in the passage in August 2017 of a bill in Germany called Nets DG, uh, which, which basically put a $50 million fine on social media companies if they didn't take down uh, basically misinformation or certain kinds of hate speech or, or you know abuse against journalists online. Uh, I mean, all this stuff. The devil is in the details with how they define. They defined it basically to mean populist language. At the time, Germany was very the uh, the foreign policy establishment was very concerned about a rising upstart right wing populist party in Germany called Alternative for Deutschland (AfD), and so they basically passed Nets DG as a way to take out <laughs> AfD from the political equation and fine social media companies fifty million dollars for allowing that content to be on there, uh, and it spilled over into the European Union, and. It required compliance with with NetsDG required AI because you couldn't respond to a takedown request, you know, within 24 to 48 hours. You didn't have time to assess it. But if you implemented best practices, you qualified for a buffer. Basically, uh, there was this adoption of these domestic censorship super weapons at the technological level, at the AI level, starting in late 2017, early 2018. That really is sort of censorship 2.0 after the initial analog. And um, and that basically, we've been in a sort of iterative, progressive, quantitative improvement of those censorship mechanisms. I would say from, you know, from 2018 up until 2022. I, I do think that there is, that, that a different era happened after the Musk acquisition because there was a piercing of the totalizing phalanx. Every single tech company passed the same restrictions on what you could say about COVID, passed the same restrictions on what you could say about mail-in ballots. Every single one of the majors now has a, you know, a climate misinformation policy. You, know, you get demonetized if you talk, you get banned if you talk about this, you get demonetized if you talk about that. Um, it's, and when Musk acquired Twitter, uh, a number of things happened contemporaneously, including a changeover at the house at the political level. I think we are in a sort of um, censorship 3.0 era right now where a, a lot of the brazenness of the 2.0 era is being uh, justified rather than openly promoted, is being negotiated rather than being accepted at face value. Um and there's a unique moment of opportunity for people who believe in, in freedom on the internet um, to use this as a moment to fight back. Has the Musk acquisition caused a sort of laziest argument for industry coordination, which is our competitors are doing it, therefore we need to do it as well to cover our legal butts? Is that is that the mechanism by which um, Musk has, has, has made it a more open environment or, or Talk me through why that is. Sure. So you could have confidence, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, how to sink a Titanic. Mm -hmm. when, a, a lot of government money, a lot of um, censorship industry thought leadership 
went into this idea of stopping cross-platform promotion of band narratives or, or, or ideas. Um, there, was, there was sort of this idea, you know, this uh, contagion concept that- uh, Something know, that went viral on YouTube could get viral on Twitter, could get viral on right. Facebook. And so you need to, and in fact, the more people perceive something to be censored, the more the censorship needed to be 100% rather than 99%. Right. Because if there was, when people perceive something to be censored, the, you know, they call it the martyr effect. Andy O'Connell, who is a former public policy at Facebook, uh, uh, C-suite guy, um, uh, former Obama State Department, he, he gave a, a talk at Stanford in 2019 where one of his, was his co they were talking about the martyr effect and how to stop uh, people from noticing they're being censored. And what came out of that conference was a consensus essentially that they needed nuance, the phrase was nuanced and covert. The content moderation had to be people. You know, the solution was to stop people from from uh, from figuring out that they were being censored or censored in the way that they would naturally think they were mm -hmm. being censored. So you started to have DARPA grant money flow into this. You know, um, one of the DARPA grants I've talked about is this this grant to this uh, George Wash uh, GWU uh, researcher um, who on on four ways to stop the mar the martyr effect. You know, uh, you know we've looked at top down censorship. But banning, you know, the account we want banned. But what if instead of banning him, we actually banned, you know, three of his top lieutenants, or we banned, you know, twenty percent of his base? So they had this whole model for stopping the martyr effect. This is government funded. This is a DARPA grant for um, top down, bottom up, random, partialized, and then they had one for basically an ideological civil war where you actually sort of use a redirect method that Google Jigsaw and Moonshot CVE developed in order to promote the most. Uh, uh, so in order to basically cleave the ideology off from its more mainstream aspects versus its its more you know, more approved narratives versus its, its more un so you sort of artificially over promote the aspects of the ideology that are most adjacent so you sort of attenuate the ideology over time and all this is to stop people from noticing they're being censored because if they know they're being censored they think oh well this thing is probably correct if the government is trying to stop it so uh, you had this whole, you had this whole sort of, you know, they called it like cross-platform point of origin research. You know, something you know would or you know they want to make sure if something originated on one platform, it would not have contagion into these others. This is why and, they keep going after 4chan and 8chan. Right, right. Well, there was a huge yes, it's exactly right. You know, they had this whole all these infographics on the amplification funnel. You know, this idea that you'd have these sort of memes that would start there. That it would go from 4chan to Reddit to Twitter to Facebook to Fox News. You know, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you could stop it early in the funnel, the long fuse of misinformation, if you could, you know, it's a it's a bomb that's going to go off. And so you have to stop it while it's it's, you know, it's ironically, it's the exact opposite of the First Amendment standard under under Brandenburg, which is imminent, you know, which is you know, um, an imminent call, uh, uh, imminent call, inc in, imminent incitement to lawlessness. Long fuse of misinformation is the polar opposite of that in every conceivable regard. Instead of imminent, it's long fuse. Instead of incitement, it's simple misinformation. And instead of lawlessness, or, you know, it's, it's just things. your yeah, it's opinion. <laughs> it's just an opinion. Um, and yet you have the U.S. government who's basically providing $100 million in subsidies to this to fund an entire industry. And this money is coming from DARPA, DARPA National Science Foundation, DOD Minerva Initiative, the State Department, USAID uh, on COVID. It's coming from HHS and NIH. Um, you know, and, you're, and you even see some DHS grants and, and uh, FBI compensation around these things. So, um, you know, it's a massive industry. It's totally subsidized by the government. We need to stop it now. So we've talked a lot about the social media commonly understood aspects of this tech censorship problem, but there's two other avenues where it has been developing slowly and then I think more quickly um, in the recent years. Um, and that's in uh, the core infrastructure of the internet that is subcutaneous to any app developed on it, and then banking. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the state of play in both of those sectors right now? It's hard to assess um, because you, know, you had this sort of seismic event around the turnover between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. You know, you, you had this kind of zany schizophrenic moment uh, in January 2021 between January 6th the the deplatforming of a sitting president and then this 
sort of attempted profusion to break the silicon you know wall uh you know uh that descended over over speech online through you know alternative social media platforms like parlor it when when parlor was cut off from the backbone of internet infrastructure you know they were i think they were cut you know not only were they debanked uh you know they couldn't use credit card processing uh they also i believe were cut off from aws they were cut off from cloud services that they it was a you know, gatekeepers at the backbone level. And in fact, you, you see something very similar that happened uh, with a website that I believe is called Kiwi Farms mm -hmm. that was cut off by Cloudflare, um, you know, uh, just, just a few months ago. And the CEO of Cloudflare- And is, that's after Cloudflare has said at various points over the years that, hey, we really don't want to do this. We really don't want to do this ever again. It feels like every few months they're like, we never want to do this again, but we're going to do it in this case. Right. And, and the CEO of Cloudflare is actually on the- CISA DHS subcommittee for mis and disinformation. He's one of the seven members under Kate Starbird, who chairs that committee, who was the uh, who was who DHS deputized to censor 22 million tweets for the uh, for the 2020 election for misinformation. It's just basically the one of the lead operatives for censoring mail in ballots, get, coercing the tech companies to add that as a toss violation. Oh, also on that committee is Vijaya Gotti, the 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 Twitter censor in chief. So, you know, it's one big dinner party and the American people are not invited to it. Um, She's still on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so you have this, um, but what I will say is it's not like that parlor, uh, you know, um, infrastructure deplatforming went unnoticed. Uh, there was a lot of thought leadership chatter about whether or not that was a very special uh, instance where there was just a, a, a huge spookage in the national security state about whether or not our democracy would survive. And it was sort of a stopgap thing. And if we could do it again with full knowledge, we wouldn't have necessarily done. There was a lot of um, collateral political, collateral damage to the political capital because so many people saw what happened to Parler. It was such a high visibility event that you had an entire political party's presidential candidate attempt at one point to throw their weight behind a free market competitor only to discover rudely and many for the first time that this is not a free market. You know, you do not, this is, this is a, this is a utility structure. You know, you cannot create a website. You know, what, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to lay your own subsea cables across the Atlantic ocean to build your own internet so that you can get around you know, Cloudflare, and uh, you're going to build your own, you're going to, if, if I want to start a, a website that's got my own opinions, I need to, I need to build a, I need to own a bank, which means I'm going to need a hundred million dollars in bank licensing, essentially back, backstopping it. I'm going to need to, you know, lay copper across the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean so that I can connect to the World Wide Web. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to need to have my own, you know, I mean, you're building your own sovereign country at that point. Mm -hmm. And none of these tech companies did Challenge that. They accepted. took advantage of the, <laughs> but they took advantage yeah. of, of ARPANET infrastructure right. from the 1960s and the in the mm. Department of Defense. You didn't build that. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's right. The universal thump comes around. I think that's a fair line here. Yeah. You know, one of one of the challenges uh, I think in this issue area is the solutions are Byzantine, non-obvious, um, at least I think so, and 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 have a lot of friction associated with them. And there's a bunch of different baskets that people um, uh, have tried to uh, put policy forward in uh, when it comes to the issue of technology more broadly, but specifically tech censorship. There's Section 230 stuff. There's antitrust. There's data privacy. There's build your own, and there's consumer protection. Really quickly, I would just be curious. What, what do you think of the opportunities and options that have been put forward on the table by the kind of institutional right? Are they enough? And, and what do you think has more merit than other things? To me, I think the strategic equation changes when you stop looking at censorship as an act and you look at it as an industry. Um, I remember watching from the White House as um, people witnessed the problem of social media censorship and clamored for a super easy fix, a sort of, you know, headshot that you know, that would just solve the whole problem, as opposed to looking at it as a system with joints. It's got shoulders, it's got knees, it's got elbows. 
It's got, you know, if you look at all the different uh, requirements to sustain a censorship industry, you start to see a lot of the ways that people who believe in internet freedom can um, can uh, can get leverage um, by by really being in the trenches on this rather than trying to solve it at the academic level. Look, I support all efforts for for fair Section two hundred and thirty reform and enforcement. Um, I, I wish every single person involved in that the best of luck and uh, anything that can be done to, to support that in the interest of internet freedom should, should be given. Um, uh, in the meantime, you got a hundred million dollars from the federal government who's going to pay the very people who, who who are taking your tax money to seal your mouth shut, you know, to stop you from ever being able to have access unfettered to the information age. You're kicked back to the industrial age if you have the wrong opinion online and, and it's your own tax dollar subsidizing it. They're, uh, you know, step one is a complete and total ban at the appropriations level of all federal funding that directly or indirectly trickles back to any individual or institution associated with domestic censorship. Now, the first thing you're going to run into here is something you know that I call the foreign to domestic switcheroo, which is a sort of laundering technique that was done when the national security state basically leveraged the meme of Russiagate and Russian interference on social media to then saying, hey, you know, if you squint and look at it, Misinformation is also a threat to democracy, whether the Russians are involved or not. So your opinions on mail-in ballots or COVID origins uh, are also a cyber attack on our critical infrastructure. <laughs> That's what they did. That's what CISA did. Yeah, CISA, CISA used that in the summer of 2020. CISA was created. CISA is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency out of the Department of Homeland Security. It was created by the Trump administration by act of Congress in November 2018 as a concession to basically uh, uh, stave off the Mueller investigation to sort of win support from the foreign policy wing of the Republican Party. Um, and as, as a basically as a bipartisan thing with Democrats and um, more neoconservative oriented Republicans uh, to stop what was perceived as a threat that Russians were like hacking U.S. voting systems. And so so that's what the cybersecurity comes from. It was at the time in 2018 you know, there was this, per, you know, there's this whole sort of meme of Russian hacking and it was unsubstantiated, but CrowdStrike had made some initial, you know, sort of preliminary. So <laughs> when that fell apart and then when the Mueller investigation died on the stand, when Mueller basically imploded in, in July 2019, within 60 days, a whole of society, whole of government uh, uh, initiative was was basically agreed upon. I mean, you can look at the at the actual government documents where they talk about this openly. Is a there's a great DHS memo on this from September 2019 I reference, where they where they move from Russia as the as the pretext, Russian disinformation, to saying domestic disinformation is actually just as much a threat, maybe even a greater threat than 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 Russian disinformation. It's, it's an attack on democracy. It undermines faith in government and democratic institutions. So there's a compelling national security interest in stopping the proliferation of mis and disinformation online. That was the predicate that was used. So you had basically this network within DHS, principally CIA and NSA hacking you know, professionals uh, who then partnered with uh, their peers in the social sciences at Stanford, at UW, at the Harvard Belfer Center, at MITRE. I mean, there's a, a million of these constellation groups who contributed to the censorship sausage. Um, and the predicate they used is that, well, look, we're in charge of election security uh, and misinformation is a threat to election security because it undermines faith in democracy. So therefore, misinformation is an attack on critical infrastructure. And since we're tasked with defending critical infrastructure, the only way that we can stop this attack is by censoring the tweet. So we're going to deputize our outside partners to work with the social media companies using our DHS domestic disinformation switchboard to censor at scale. And that's how 22 million tweets about mail-in ballots were all taken down from the internet between uh, June and November, 2020. But then <laughs> they got they got extremely greedy at that point. They said, well, you know what? Elections are critical infrastructure. That's what gave us, that's what gave us the power to censor the election. You know what? If you squint and look at it, 
Public health is also critical infrastructure. Hospitals, you know, healthcare. So the COVID is also critical infrastructure. Everything that keeps me in power is critical infrastructure. <laughs> That's the thing. You know, it's it's like that line from the Avengers with Hulk. You know, they, they said, he says, you know, my secret is I'm always angry. You know, their, their secret is everything's critical infrastructure. So, so, and what they did is, you know. Democracy they, is when they win. And anything that is making them not win is anti-democracy. You know, the, the absolute irony of, of, of the, you know, the whole society attempt to frame this as a, as defending, uh, you know, defending democracy, they're defending themselves from democracy. The problem is democracy would, would, you know, vote potentially for a different foreign policy. The problem is democracy might vote for the wrong political candidate. The problem is democracy might popularize a particular news story or narrative. They don't want to be inflated. They are using the pretext of a digital defense of democracy to defend themselves from democracy. Mm -hmm. That's really the story here. Um, and in fact, if you go back and you look at contemporaneous literature from, from 2017, their first iteration of this was not pro-democracy. They actually argued, is there such a thing as too much democracy? Have we gone too far? Do we need bumper cars on democracy? There was there were whole books. Of, in, in, amazingly, the very people who would use democracy as, as, the, as the branding card you know, in um, you know, in in 2020, we're we're originally publishing. Uh, hey, you know, maybe we need a new doctrine that's not so reliant on like the concepts of you know for, for an open society, uh, because it looks like we may actually lose at the electoral level if everybody is allowed to you know if if the New York Times is reduced to a medium sized Facebook page, then we are no longer the agenda setters. You could have a you could have Mr. Beast being the agenda setter, and what if you know Mr. Beast is a different opinion on Ukraine or COVID or whatnot? So, um, you know, so I guess where, where I'm where I'm going with this is, you know, you have this this stakeholder negotiation, and you know, as I see it, you know, with respect to the Musk acquisition, it broke the seal, uh, it broke the hundred percent. Look, the Titanic went down. Presumably, from a you know, you know, hitting an iceberg and one hole can take down the whole thing. If there's not a hundred percent censorship, if there's some hub somewhere, all the water is going to flow into that, and that thing's going to get huge. And Musk is unique because he does not run a lemonade stand either. He runs SpaceX. I know from this, my State Department work how integral st SpaceX is to um, you know to to our management of of foreign affairs. I mean, the fact is is Satellite communications are a huge part of of our our information superiority of any number of things that are probably not appropriate for this 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 setting. But the point is, is um, there is a way they could that that he could be taken out through using a sort of um, you know a, a, a predicate of basically nationalizing you know the companies that that Musk you know you could nationalize SpaceX for example on the uh, on on various grounds around it being you know, essential and core to, you know, U.S. national security interests. But the flight from capital that would happen if the world's richest man had, his, had you know, the crown jewels of his economic empire seized by the U.S. government, especially at a time of great power competition uh, with China and other countries, um, you know, who, who are competing to attract investment capital, uh, there is a bind that the Musk uh, uh, problem poses to the national security state in this instance, which gives a very sort of unique protection for people who believe in digital liberty because the great man theory of history is real. One person's, you know, a particular eccentricities really can change the world. And you are seeing right now at the thought leadership level, a sort of reconfiguration of how they structure censorship. CISA two weeks ago wiped the word domestic from its, from its mystis and malinformation page. Two weeks ago, there, there's I've seen many signs of an attempt to walk back what's been done to try to use a more sophisticated laundering apparatus because now you are starting to see cultural figures like Joe Rogan, Russell Brand, Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi, Michael Schump. You're starting to see even Democrats get on board uh, at the cultural level, even if not at the congressional level. And I think they know that they got away with a fast one. They pulled off a dirty trick and and. It is not as politically sustainable as they thought it would be when there was 100% control over social media. Yeah. Well, the problem is, is that there's no walking back the fact that they got a presidential election out of it. Um, 
what would you tell, and you've been here this week partially to do this, your entrepreneurial Republican member of Congress to be focused on right now when it comes to the big tech issue? Sure. So, you know, you, you have two sides of this. You have a sort of censorship side and you have a digital economy side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the censorship side, you know, we, we, we've covered a fair amount of it. You know, I think that there needs to be, um, just as in the church committee hearings, you know, Frank Church's deal with with James Jesus Angleton and whatnot was not like, you know, we're going to do these hearings to split the CIA into a thousand pieces. The whole the whole thing was, look, we're going to need some disclosure of 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 things that have been going on behind the scenes, not because we want to destroy you, but because we want to trust you. The only way that you can restore trust after these known scandals is if you come clean and uh, and that's the only way that trust can be restored. Uh, I believe that uh, basically almost every conceivable oversight wing of the Republican House uh, has a a moment and a, and a special duty to use hearings for transparency, to use subpoena power to the you know to the utmost potential. You know, there's there's about a dozen other major actors in addition to the subpoenas that were fired off at, at Google, Facebook, and uh, and TikTok by by Jim Jordan's weaponization subcommittee two weeks ago, um, including to the, you know the the messaging companies who hosted the communications for censorship coordination between government officials with .gov you know uh, addresses, um, and the private sector that they outsourced the censorship to, that. That could be subpoenaed very easily, and it would be, you know, I liken it to a sort of perfectly preserved First Amendment crime scene. You know, those records, if subpoenaed, would would show the totality of government co coordination of censorship on COVID, on elections, uh, and potentially on, on, on a range of other issues that, for example, DHS gave itself jurisdiction over, such as immigration and, you know, financial misinformation. Um, uh, you know... So on the one hand, focus on on subpoenas, hearings, oversight, appropriations. Absolutely, there need to be riders in the next appropriation bill to absolutely defund the speech police. Uh, at least make the people in the private sector pay out of their own pockets if they're going to do, if, you know, for, on the censorship side. I believe there needs to be AI transparency. We're at a moment right now where, um, especially with all the gener generative AI around chat GPT and BARD and whatnot, um, the people who control the trust and safety layers of that are going to be able to control the political and, and cultural hearts and minds. To, uh, if, the, if they are, are incentivized or permitted to do that in the dark, uh, by the time people even really catch on to all the dirty tricks they're using, it's going to be too late. I think that there's lots of different sort of AI transparency uh, 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 regulations that could be done to at least provide that would, you, know, you have the situation right now where you have terms of service, you know, that we mentioned, um, uh, that the tech platforms have, but that allows them to do double speak because you don't know what they're actually writing into the, uh, the content moderation algorithms that may totally invert something. For example, Vijaya Gotti, you know, was, res was responsible for the whole learn to code, you know, uh, uh, hashtag being a terms of service violation. There were tens of thousands of people who got suspended Twitter accounts for typing the hashtag learn to code in response to journalists layoffs. I think uh, I was suspended at least once for it. <laughs> Vijaya guy defended that as being a terms of service violation of, of the category of targeted abuse and harassment. But you would have no idea reading that, uh, you know, if you just read the Twitter terms of service and you say, well, we prohibit targeted abuse and harassment. Everyone is going to think that means if you are like, you know, doxing somebody's address or doing a, you know, imminent threat to physical harm or something. Well, that's allowed when you're doing it to right wingers. <laughs> well, there you go. But if you were, if you were able to just download a CSV file that just shows, okay, well, how this is your terms of service, what AI are you using to enforce it? Let me see all your, let me see all of your word embeddings. Let me see, let me see, you know, how, how you're deriving the sentiment analysis. Um, now, now the, now, the rejoinder to that, well, is if we tell you how we're doing it, you're going to try to get around it. But there's the rub, right? So you actually don't even want, this is not, you're not just prohibiting what you're saying you're prohibiting. 
you're prohibiting this entire sub-universe, this unstated sub-universe, that you don't even want people to enter that universe around it. You are, you're doing a conflation tactic here. You know, you're sort of inflate, you're, you're taking this inflated meme mm. of targeted abuse and harassment, which 100% of people agree is like a bad thing. Yeah. You're conflating it with what you really want to target, which is you want to stop people from undermining legacy journalists mm -hmm. uh, because you're threatened by alternative news. Um, and then you're using that conflation predicate to, as an elimination predicate to, to eliminate all those alternative forms of speech. If there was if there was AI transparency, they wouldn't be able to get away with that because everybody would be able to just point to the URL that says, ah, they say target abuse and harassment, but what that really means is hashtag learn to code and a thousand other things like it. You know, they had to reverse that learn to code policy eventually because they look so ridiculous on the Joe Rogan show when they tried to defend it. Uh, even Jack Dorsey didn't appear to be aware of it as his own, you know, chief legal officer was defending it. Um, the Disinformation Governance Board was shut down in about a week and a half when they gave it the wrong name, when they couldn't cover it up. The National Endowment for Democracy just recently disavowed the Global Disinformation Index, which they had been funding the moment the Washington Examiner wrote an op-ed on it, wrote, wrote, a, wrote an investigation on it. They know they're doing wrong here and they scatter from the sunlight. The answer is turn the lights on. The next time there is a pro-free speech president elected, what are the first few things they need to do? Well, so we've talked about funding and we've and we've talked about, um, you know, having a more inclusive set of stakeholders represented, if you will. There are there's a there's <laughs> lobbyists. Well, um, I'm trying to compromise and use their own lingo because the fact is, is, you know, there's a lobby for Google, but there's no lobby for the American people on this. You know, um, you don't have flower shop owners who can't market to the, you know, their local hometown because they don't have a Facebook or a Twitter anymore because they didn't have been to a mail. Those people don't have a lobby. Um so you know we've, we've talked about get, you know axing the funding on day one. I think there also needs to you know uh, be a prohibition on on the revolving on aspects of the revol of the revolving door. You have a situation right now where you have people who go from high ranking national security positions straight into the content moderation teams of all of the major social media companies, and there and it's one thing to do that on the foreign side. I've got no problem with a totally red blooded, full throated maximalist foreign policy. But there has to be a respect between the firewall on foreign and domestic. When we deputized the, the national security state in 1947 with the National Security Act and with NSC 10-2 to be able to do, you know, a license to do anything, you know, in Pompeo's words, you know, to, a license to lie, cheat or steal. Um, that was because we recognized it's a big, bad world out there and we may need a Department of Dirty Tricks to take on, you know, what, you know, as George Kennan put it in his, his 1948 memo, the inauguration of organized warfare, of organized political warfare, the whole thing was, listen, we need a department of dirty tricks because if we don't, the Bolsheviks will, and they'll win the 21st century, yada, yada. Okay, understood. But that, there has to be a firewall on the foreign and domestic, which means ending the, the laundering systems that happen right now. There's about a- And it's pretty straightforward, right? It's, you can't do this to American citizens, but you can do this to they're not American. It's right. Like, it's, we have a category of right. who you're not allowed to do this stuff to. Right. But the laundering process has to be exposed and, and prohibited, frankly, mm -hmm. both at the appropriations level and I think at a, at, a, at a regulatory level as well, which is, you know, you've got this example, for example, the Pentagon. Um, you got a very strange political constellation of pieces right now on the political chessboard where you've got, you know, in 2016, you had a sort of Bernie Sanders populist left and a Donald Trump populist right. And there were sort of two threats to traditional Pentagon brass on the foreign policy side. You know, you had this sort of populist right who wanted to reappropriate a, a sort of foreign policy establishment funds and DOD funds for nationalist objectives, you know, manufacturing sort of uh, in a, you know, just a number of domestic initiatives. And then you had the Bernie Sanders left, which said, okay, we're going to take Pentagon funding and we're going to reappropriate for universal health care and free, free, free college and whatnot. The Bernie Sanders left has been completely crushed at the political level. I mean, there's vestiges of it in the media through media figures like Jimmy Dore and Max Blumenthal and those folks. But at the political level, you know, every single one of, of, of the, the squad members and Bernie, 
uh, have completely fallen in line with party leadership on the Dem side. That's not true on the Republican side. One of the you know one of the compromises that Kevin McCarthy was essentially persuaded, we'll say, you know, to agree to for the speaker battle was a $75 billion cut to the Pentagon. Well, lo and behold, who are the top political targets of the censorship mercenary groups who are being funded by the Pentagon? It's all Freedom Caucus people. You have, so the, the Pentagon gives government grants and contracts to groups like Graphica, to groups like NewsGuard, to groups like Omelas, to, um, to groups like the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Lab. Those are all Pentagon funded. Now, and, and who are their targets though? Their targets are Trump supporters. All 21 of the top 21 repeat misinformation spreaders identified by Grafica and the Atlantic Council's DFR lab, both of them get millions of dollars in Pentagon funding. I think $7 million for Grafica over the past couple of years, $2 million from the Atlantic Council. Those, the Pentagon says, oh, well, they're helping us deal with misinf- mis- and disinformation from Russia and Iran. But the, they're not giving it to a separate side business that they're running. They're, those, they're turning around and using that their business models are, they don't need to make a dime on censoring your website because their money is coming from the Pentagon on the foreign side. This would be like if Wraith, you know, if what if it wasn't NewsGuard who was censoring your website? It was Raytheon. <laughs> you know, Raytheon would dissolve overnight if the, if the U.S. Department of Defense stopped buying Raytheon missiles. But if, if Raytheon opened up a domestic censorship shop to censor critics of the Pentagon or the political faction associated with reducing the Pentagon's budget, you would say that's not fair. Raytheon's basically a government cutout. You know, it's my taxpayers who are paying for Ra- Raytheon doesn't make a need to make a build a business model censoring me online. Their business model is selling missiles mm-hmm. to, to the national security state. The same, this is being done in a dozen different ways in, in DOD alone. And then you add on the State Department's role in this laundering process, US aid. You have tens of millions of dollars. You know, I've documented over 100 million from, from of the whole of government, but that is going to subsidize domestic censorship that is laundered through this sort of, you know, foreign predicate. For the most part, some of it just is straight up domestic. The National Science Foundation, DHS, CISA, you know, didn't even use that sophisticated laundering predicate. But what the next U.S. president has to do, and if Biden is so inclined, this is a bipartisan issue. Hey, I said free speech president. <laughs> right, know, exactly. <laughs> um, um, is to is to seal back shut what should have been, you know, there should have been gorilla glue on the Pandora's box about the foreign, you know, foreign, you know, the foreign department of dirty tricks mm-hmm. that we use here. That thing should have been, there should have been nails on that thing to nail that, that down. That Pandora's box has been opened up. And uh, if you shut that down, uh, you will handicap the censorship industry uh, in ways that are existential to its very existence. One of the things you've been saying this entire time is speaking candidly that a lot of this stuff is basically just directed at Trump supporters, right? And and I like that um, for similar reasons as when we're talking about affirmative action, you know, people contort themselves into all sorts of pretzel shapes to pretend like it isn't what it is, which is anti-white straight male like that's functionally and and i think that sometimes in the free speech industry and there definitely is a free speech ink out there um people love to pretend like this is a, a bipartisan issue you know there's left-wing censorship and there's right-wing censorship um well, do, do, do you think that's right um that, that that there's any sort of bipartisan aspect to it or is it primarily overwhelmingly targeted towards one side of the 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 political aisle so I mean, I would I would say yes to, to both of, of the ways that you phrase that. I absolutely see this as being bipartisan, um, but in a in a in a way that's nuanced that I'd, I'd like to to explain, which is to say that you had these threats. You know, I mentioned the targeting of Bernie early Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn in, in the UK, um, who who had a sort of what was perceived as a sort of anti NATO stance again as a, from a sort of left wing socialist perspective. Um, the reason as I see it, that that Trump supporters have been disproportionately targeted is because they've been disproportionately politically successful. It's not just Trump supporters in the US, it's also the right-wing populist parties. And a lot of this started in when I mentioned, you know, the, the origin of this in 2014. And then, you know, one of the reasons NATO, you know, uh, entered the censorship industry so early was because after Brexit happened, 
There was a fear that Frexit was going to happen in France with Marine Le Pen. Italy exit was going to happen with Matteo Savini in Italy. Grexit was going to happen in, in Greece. Spexit was going to happen at the Vox Party in Spain. The whole EU was going to fall apart. So therefore, NATO was going to fall apart. So therefore, the entire rules-based international order was going to fall apart. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> but, but, but those threats were perceived as, as primarily they were targeting right-wing populists. But actually, if you look at the period between Brexit and the 2016 election, you can go back and you can see Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who was the former head of NATO, um, basically positing Jeremy Corbyn as the big bad you know, boogeyman uh, uh, that they feared uh, the political success of. At that time, this is still five months before the U.S. election. They, they didn't think Trump was even at a chance. You know, the real threat was like left-wing populist parties, uh, many of the, whose websites have been deplatformed um, uh, because of, of their foreign policy stance. Uh, you know, a lot of this came to a head around the Syria, uh, you know, boots on the ground, sort of, you know, NATO having to deal with this left flank from from a lot of sort of uh, anti-imperialist left wing folks who were pushing back on the political support for military operations in Syria. Um, but the reason you do have such disproportionate, in my assessment, uh, uh, targeting of Trump supporters is because Trump actually won. Bernie didn't didn't win. Corbyn didn't win. They were stopped before they got to that point. Uh, if they were to get in power, I suspect you would have something similar to what was done to left wing, you know, uh, left wing parties in power that underwent the the kind of um, you know na national security state uh, uh, induced destabilization efforts, uh, you know, during during the Cold War. Um, and by the way, I don't think that any self respecting conservative wants to win you know, by, uh, by the technique that has been used against them in this case. Yeah. You know, I, if, if, if I disagree with Bernie Sanders on universal health care or, uh, or free college or whatever, I don't want to win be because, you know, because we've sealed every Bernie supporter's mouth shut. You want to win because, you know, you've won over hearts and minds, not because you've, you know, you've, you win by default by depriving your, your, I mean, I, th I liken it to a sort of thummy war. You know, there's no honor in winning using, you know, using a trick when, you know, when you use your index finger. But that's that's what was, was done here. And, you know, the universal thump will get passed around on this uh, any time. When, when Bernie Sanders ran against Joe Biden in, in late 2019, you saw how quickly they, they invoked uh, Russia, Russia support for Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie bent the knee quickly. You know, Bernie lived up to the, the meme about him not having any backbone. Um, Trump did not. Uh, but the day will come when left-wing populists um, persevere into the political sphere, when, when they're able to stand up to Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer at the congressional level, uh, to the extent that they ride into power one day on the on the force of some of the, the cultural figures who, who are fairly influential right now. I could totally see this exact apparatus um, being used with equal heavy handedness on them. It just so happens it's our time in, in the, in the, you know, it, it's the time of people. And I say this are in the sense that, you know, this is a, you know, this is a conservative setting and I was obviously a Republican political appointee, um, but no one should have this kind of power. I and mean, this is, this is how you get a one party state. This is how you get total civil military fusion, you know, with respect to the government and the, and the private sector. Um, and, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a new thing. It is in somewhere between its infancy and its adolescence. If it can be stopped before maturity, then we can save the moment of freedom that the free and open internet represented during its golden age. We were talking off this podcast um, yesterday um, and uh, you were telling stories where people would call you like Mike Stradamus or Ben Stradamus um, because you you were beating the drum about uh, some of these issues way before anyone else was. I'd be very curious to close out. What is the thing that you have your hair on fire about right now that no one else is paying attention to where you're going to be doing an unfortunate victory lap in a few years unless we take action now? Well, you know, just to make this answer entertaining, this might not be the number one, but, you know, we have seen this week alone an incredible profusion of AI generative technology. And we talked about this briefly in an earlier segment, but I remember vividly when there was this stakeholder 
you know, sort of consensus building process around how to stop the development of virtual reality um, uh, content. You know, when when you had Palmer Lucky and you had these sort of, this is 2017, 2018, you had this sort of what looked to be this totally new and brilliant landscape of virtual reality content creation through the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. This was something that Mark Zuckerberg became completely enchanted with, potentially threw away Facebook's entire competitive advantage because he was so enchanted by it. I too, I actually thought Zuckerberg was was brilliant at the moment that he identified, you know, uh, VR and a sort of metaverse as, as a as a future there. I thought it was a uh, you know, uh, but <laughs> he relied on a um, on an ecosystem that was quickly closed up because you had a whole society stakeholder movement into restricting the kinds of content that could be created in VR. If you wanted to pump, the, you know, we talk about the trust and safety layers for censorship algorithms on social media. That was applied so hard, so fast, and so early in the VR space that you had v, you know, VR content creators in, in Unity who couldn't program anything without making sure that it hit every little intersectional you know, checklist item you know, the, the gatekeepers in terms of, uh, you know, uh, access through the apps, the whole thing was basically can, you know, uh, dominated by this alliance between national security, state, state, the foreign policy establishment stakeholders and, you know, the sort of civil society, you know, you know, same sort of Harvard, Stanford sort of class we're talking about here. And that nipped the whole, the whole development in the bud and made any development that came out of it totally consistent and impossible to challenge um, the foreign policy establishment, even through little memes, concepts, uh, uh, ways of telling history. You, know, you couldn't make a you couldn't make a, a game about the Cold War without it, you know, being vetted by basically a, a DOD pass through for making sure it had the right opinion on Russia as the bad guy. And again, I'm not even saying that you know maybe there's a role for that, but it, it, in the early in its infancy, it was completely dominated. And my concern right now is you are going to have a situation where you, you know, if, if we had the industrial age and then the information age, and now we're in this, we're about to enter this, this DJing stage, you know, this, uh, this, where you're, where the, we're going to be having to DJ different kinds of AI for, for standard tasks in order to be competitive with our fellow peers in every industry in the not too distant future. My concern is that if free market, private enterprise, limited government folks are not uh, included at, at the stakeholder table, if they do not form partnerships at the state and federal uh, government level, if they do not uh, have the uh, appropriate level of financial and institutional backing, if they are not aggressive about creating leverage points to force this, uh, you know, to, to force their own inclusion at this table uh, and to pull whatever lever levers necessary to, to make that the case, then you will see these AI, uh, th these AI conduits for the reality we live in completely box them out. And once you're boxed out, you know, it's, it's like the cancer having metastasized into the brain and lungs. You, you catch it early. You can, you can, you can have your own interests represented. If you don't, it's speak now or forever hold your peace. Mike, how can people keep up with everything you're saying and thinking on all of these issues. So two places, first and foremost, our foundation's website is foundationforfreedomonline.com. That's all one word, uh, or the acronym FFO. And you can follow me personally on my Twitter account at Mike Benz Cyber. And what will people find? What should, what, you know, we have a lot of Hill staff and uh, members of Congress that listen to this show. Um, what specifically should people be going to you and your website in order to learn more about and to find out more about? Sure, so we are at the tip of the spear for understanding the dynamics of the censorship industry at the government level, the private sector level, the civil society level, the news media and fact checking. Uh, we have done uh, what I believe and I'm proud of is I think the most comprehensive uh, and frankly, um, I think a lot of people experience FFO's content as being life-changing in the sense that it helps to understand and make sense of what has been a very opaque and confusing process to many people. Uh, an existentially uh, uh, sort of shadowy process to a lot of people uh, over the past six, seven years. Uh, I believe that FFO's content is is shining a light in that, uh, and it, it, there's there's 
it's basically a secret decoder ring to understanding the censorship industry. Mike, thank you for everything that you do. And I really mean that. Um, it's such an important issue to be paying attention to. And thank you for coming on the podcast. Likewise, it's a pleasure. Part of the reason we like to keep the listenership to this podcast cozy and intimate is because I really try to make it a show listened to by people who are most in a position to do something about it. Because if I wasn't in a position to do something uh, about everything that you just heard Mike talk about, uh, I'd consider jumping off a bridge. I'm kidding, mostly. But um, again, for those of you who are influential in the public policy process, either as Hill staff, as nonprofit staffers, journalists, what have you, please, please, please chase down these stories, chase down the ideas that Mike is talking about. They're essential and critical to ensuring that the political right in this country has an opportunity to engage in governance at all. It is not a political issue in and of itself. It's a metapolitical issue that determines everything else. You can't have a based immigration policy or a based trade policy if Google can say, actually, it's um, a violation of democracy if you say that you can't turn America into an open-air bazaar. Um, the tech issue is existential. It's extremely important. We highly recommend that you guys pay as close attention to it as humanly possible. There's a lot of work to be done on it. Um, but keep up with everything that we're doing at American Moment at AmericanMoment.org. Rate and review this podcast. Five stars, please. Go on YouTube. Subscribe. Uh, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Go follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at ammomentorg. And be sure to share it with all of your friends. We'll see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.